Hello viewers, you're watching Dukascopy TV. I'm Natalie McDonald. Joining me in the studio now is a company which is very active about sustainable development and future carbon efforts. I'm joined by Dirk Forrester of AETA. Dirk, thank you very much for coming in today. A pleasure, thank you for having me. No problem at all, always lovely to see you. Now, AITA recently urged world officials to accelerate efforts to develop a framework for a market-based approach for the 2015 Paris Climate Deal. Now, you've suggested what is an intensified effort towards CDM market frameworks. Walk us through your thinking firstly on, on this matter. I think what um, my member companies liked about the CDM is that it's a, a fungible commodity, a fungible carbon reduction that could be used for compliance in Japan or anywhere in Europe or any of the jurisdictions that were part of the old system, the Kyoto Protocol. And that system continues to operate up until 2020. So when we think about what's coming post-2020, which is what the Paris Agreement is all about, that's sort of the holy grail of what we're looking for, is a framework where credits issued by different countries can be recognized. And that needs some kind of UN framework, some kind of connectivity underneath all of the systems tying them together. And uh, just this week, negotiators are meeting in Bonn, Germany. Uh, they're doing more preparation for a meeting later this year in uh, Lima, Peru, that will be the final big session before Paris next year. And at that session, they're supposed to table their proposals for how all of this will work. So this is a critical time for us, and we're very interested in pushing the governments to make sure that we can have these market-friendly approaches that keep the cost down and enable business to make the transition cost effectively. Now from Paris we shift over to the US and the US Environmental Protection Agency recently announced state-specific emission rates for power plants. Can you expand on this flexibility cause the EPA has put in place with regards to how each state actually reaches those targets? Sure, I mean it's, a, it's kind of a complicated uh, mess in a way because uh, what most business really prefers is a federal law in the U.S., a new federal law that actually uh, apportions the climate responsibilities fairly across sectors and allows a market-based framework to achieve those results cost-effectively, just like Europe is doing. But the Congress won't pass a new law. And since, since uh, the Obama administration and the Congress can't get together on such a new proposal, they're using an old law, the existing Clean Air Act in the U.S., and they're starting with power plants and they say they may pursue other sectors over time. And the way they're approaching it under this law is, is to set emission rates for each state and then allow the states the flexibility on how they implement it. So what that means is California already has a market-based program, as do 10 states in the northeastern U.S. All of those states will presumably try to defend their existing program and make sure that it fits the EPA rules. So the real scramble now is about the other 39 states. And do they do a similar thing or do they come up with a different type of a flexible approach? And again, most companies would prefer a national approach, but uh, in absence of that, this, this approach may be interesting to see if states can find nuggets of flexibility in EPA's proposal. It's quite a long proposal, but it does create that option for, for, for the states. Uh, so we're going into a period now for about a year where all the action shifts away from Washington and out to the 50 states and we see what their responses will be to EPA. Now, AETA, in coordination with the World Bank Group and also Colin Messer, recently held the Carbon Expo 2014. What were some of the, the key thoughts to come out of this? Well, it, uh, three big themes. One is around markets and assessing what's going on in various markets around the world. So we talked about what's happening in the U.S. We talked about reforms pending in Brussels for the EU emissions market. And the other thing that's really interesting is that China is developing emission trading programs, starting with a set of pilots, there are seven of them um, spread across the country that they're learning from, but they're developing some kind of a national pricing program that will feed into uh, the positions they take in Paris next year. So C Carbon Expo took account of all of these developments, uh, similar things happening in Korea and in Mexico and in Chile and in South Africa. So there's these pockets of activity all over the globe that are simulating a lot of business interest. And so Carbon Expo is really a business uh, forum for business to come together, take stock of what's going on, 
Also looking at the second big theme was technology opportunities, innovative opportunities to deploy technology. And then finally, there's a new field emerging of climate finance that kind of relates to markets, but it's a little bigger than that because it can also involve public-private partnerships around infrastructure deployment for a new green infrastructure. And uh, the UN has launched a green climate fund that is just starting to get its sea legs. And uh, there's a lot of interest in talking about how that might work for companies that are interested in new investment models. Well, you touched there on investment, and this is something that I wanted to, to finish up on, really, something that will speak to our, our more investment-minded viewer. One of the items that IATA has recently expressed concerns about is the suitability of carbon credits for investment by the general public. How would you encourage this community to become involved in carbon and renewable energy investment instead then? Well, I think for uh, some of your viewers would be sophisticated investors who know what they're doing and have less concern about them. The real concerns are about pressure selling tactics on uh, general public who are not sophisticated and are told that if they invest in these voluntary carbon credits that they're going to grow up to be compliance credits that are worth a lot and that they should put their life savings into it. And that's just not on. That's, uh, that, there are no such guarantees uh, about the future of carbon credits and uh, you need to know what you're doing to be involved in the market. So we at IETA have a sister organization uh, called the International Carbon Reduction Offset Alliance that sets a code of conduct for companies that participate in voluntary carbon markets and I think a place for the general public is to get some experience through just voluntary offsetting not buying for investment purposes that you know I'm buying these to hold them because they're going to increase in value because that's very speculative and they may not know how to do that well but if it's for purposes of gaining experience uh, in offsetting your travel or offsetting your events or offsetting a company's footprint those kind of th things I think are very very healthy but I also think that that uh, companies in that business should abide by a code of conduct. So I'm, I'm proud that we have one uh, with ECROA. So you can look that up on ECROA.org, uh, I-C-R-O-A.org. I'm glad you were able to get that plug in there, Dick. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insight with us. Thank you very My much. pleasure. Thanks for having me, Natalie. That's all we've got time for right now, but we'll be back shortly with plenty more exclusive interviews for you. So don't go away. Goodbye.